Colonel Michael Robert. Crowdsourcing is a hot thing today. Can someone crowdsource me a beer from there to here? That's a rain zone. Okay, Carl, you ready for it? Yeah, sure. Thank you, thank you. I need the luck. Yes, my name is Carl Sasseron. I was uh, one of the original uh, developers of the Amiga and uh, on the software side. Um, I did the Amiga kernel, uh, the exec, and uh, it, was, it was a fun thing for me, and I'll tell you, a little bit of a background story on it and how I came to end up at Amiga, which was actually quite accidental in some ways. So that's uh, that's a story, and then I'll talk on about past Amiga into CDTV, which was uh, I left Amiga after it, after it was released, and I'll tell you the reasons why. And then came back when uh, the opportunity for CDTV arrived in the early uh, well late 80s and early 90s and uh, the story of that, how CDTV came about. So uh, I, I joined Amiga uh, right after getting married in 1983, and uh, when I walked in for the interview, um, they said, we're looking for someone to design an operating system uh, for the Amiga, and we don't care um, anything about the design of it. You can do whatever you want. <laughs> and this was a perfect thing for me because I had been designing operating systems in my mind for four years prior to that. So uh, my operating system background, I'm a, I'm a computer science and, and electrical engineer. Uh, I started working for Hewlett Packard in 1980 in the operating system kernel group for the HP 3000 line of computers, which was the main uh, computer sold, the big mini computer sold by HP at the time. And uh, I felt very honored to be part of that kernel group. Uh, everyone was much older than me. and. And uh, I was a young kid just out of school and uh, got to learn a lot from these master designers that were such experts in operating systems. Um, but it occurred to me that there was a problem with uh, operating system design back then, which was uh, the operating systems were very large, uh, they took a lot of resources, and they were very complex. And they required a lot of pieces to come together, to all be compiled together to, uh, into this monolithic uh, operating system, and that's how all the operating systems back in the early 80s worked. And uh, I started thinking about it, and I, I loved working at Hewlett Packard because they had tremendous resources back in those days. That Hewlett Packard back then was not the same as the Hewlett Packard you know today uh, selling computers. Hewlett Packard w was the best computer, uh, I mean, I should say technology company back then. They made uh, spectrum analyzers and oscilloscopes and signal generators and the best medical equipment uh, you could possibly imagine. That was the Hewlett Packard that I went to work for. And the reason I, I took the job there was they, when I went for the interview, they showed me a room that was half the size of this entire floor here, and it was full of electronic components of every type, anything. And they said, that is all yours. <laughs> Everything there, you can use it however you want. You can work on projects here, you can take it home, you can do whatever you want with that, with those fun parts. And I was just like, okay, I'll work here. <laughs> and I took those parts and I built a Z80 uh -huh. S100 bus type computer. And I put on it uh, the CPM operating system, which was what you, you know, one of the operating systems from back then. It wasn't very good. And I thought, you know, I'm an operating system person, I should write a better operating system than this. And, and something that has a lot more capability, a lot more architecture to it. And uh, working at Hewlett Packard, I got a chance to learn a lot about architecture because there were some real masters of architecture there at that company. There were many spin-offs that came off of HP that started wonderful companies within, within, within the uh, Silicon Valley. And uh, the other thing about HP was all of the information that was out there in the world of computing was available to you. They would they would get it for you. So up the road, not far, a few miles from HP was uh, a place called Xerox Park. Uh, and Xerox Park was putting out, um, they were publishing all this great technological advances in uh, things like user interfaces and uh, the very first concept of multiple windows and a mouse and all of these kinds of things. And uh, I thought, well, you know, I should try to bring some of that technology to Hewlett Packard 
And um, being the company that it was, I, I, I said, I'm going to go out and find some of this technology and bring it back. Well, I went up to Stanford University, and there was a kid there, a uh, uh, postgraduate student. Uh, his name was Andy Bechtelsheim. And he was making this little computer that was actually a pretty big computer. He called it the Sun Microsystem. The Sun System. And I said, hey, can I borrow that? <laughs> and take it back and show it to the people at Hewlett Packard. And uh, what I liked about it was bitmap graphics. Everything at the time at, uh, at HP was character graphics. So when you press the key, the letter A, it would just put the letter A. And it wasn't the individual pixels that were being composed. It was all mapped through the system and you couldn't get any other graphics on the screen, just that. And uh, the other thing that, that Andy had was a mouse, that he did an optical mouse that, that went with his son uh, system. And so I thought, this is really good. We're going to take it back. And in a few weeks, I created a user interface that ran on that system. He didn't have any user interface or anything. Very, his graphics manual for the graphics library for the original Sun was three pages of documentation. So I took that and, and uh, created a, what I saw in the Xerox. I was just copying what I saw in the Xerox, you know, part uh, documentation and created that. Kind of got it working, got some fonts together, put it on the screen. Uh, this is the future. And then I started a mission within the company to um, can try to convince people at Google Packard that that was the future, that the windowing bitmap system was the future, and it was a real uphill battle. Um, I managed to grow my, my little group there to about five people, where we built and added more capability to that. It was really a super demo. You know, you know how that is with the prototypes. And uh, took it around the company, trying to, to get someone there to build a bitmap system like that, to build something like the Sun. And uh, went all the way up to the head of HP, the, the guy that was the CEO of the company. We showed him a demo, and he said, oh, this looks pretty good. We should, uh, we should consider this. And uh, I got them to, uh, to give me an agreement for financing to go buy Sun Microsystems. <laughs> Four guys, okay, all engineers. So I walked in and uh, I said, I got a deal for you guys. I love your machines. They were up to like, they made maybe 10 machines at that point. And I said, I'd like to, to buy your company for three million dollars. And all the engineers were like, oh, we're rich. <laughs> and there's this other guy, Vinod Kushla there, who I'd not seen before, and very suspicious, from this uh, company, Kleiner Perkins. I don't know if he was a Kleiner at the time. And he said, no. I thought, no, no, you don't understand, three million dollars. No, he says, and uh, I was so pissed. I remember, I was just <laughs> all the way back to HP. I was like, these guys are idiots. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, well, we know what happened to them, don't we? <laughs> but, Cisco bottom. Yeah, Cisco. Anyway, so, but that, that convinced me that, that there was a lot to this bitmap, this idea of bitmap displays and, and, uh, and mice and everything. And the Sun, the original Sun was a very, was a much more complex machine. There were a lot of parts in it. Uh, it was, you know, it was a big system, really for the, you know, in terms of microcomputers, but it was also 68,000 base, which was cool. So, so the opportunity then uh, came one day, uh, the phone rang after I came back from my honeymoon, and uh, my wife got the phone and it was uh, someone from Amiga, it was Bob Perisot. And I don't know if you knew Bob Perisot, if you've seen Bob Perisot. Bob it was the head of software, and uh, my wife told me, she said, there's some jerk called here, and <laughs> you shouldn't call him back. He was terrible. I do not want you to go work for that company. Uh, a little company called Amiga Inc., Amiga Computer Inc., and, and I thought, well, let me just go see what it's about. Let me see what's happening down there. And uh, I went down, and that's what he said to me. If you come here, you can design whatever operating system you want. And I thought, well, I've got this little microkernel idea for an operating system and uh, I'd like to, to make that work there. So he said, okay, you're hired. So I got hired the same day and quit HP and went there. And one of the things that convinced me was uh, when I went and talked to Jay Miner and, and heard the architecture of the Amiga, what he was doing was with VLSI. It's a very large scale integration, the chips. So where Sun Microsystem was doing with discrete components, what Jay was saying is, look, we did this at Atari, 
where we can take all this technology and put onto a few chips. And we've got this special bus, and we're going to heavily multiplex this bus. We're going to have 25 DMA channels going. And I thought, wow, this is going to be fun for writing an operating system with all that power on those chips. So, uh, so my first day at, at Amiga, uh, Jay uh, came in, you know, and, and threw down on my desk the Bay Ray Atari uh, book, which was, um, you, you know that Jay's background was Atari. He was, I think, number three at Atari. So, so he thought that the Amiga operating system should be like the Atari operating system, which was a, really just a very thin layer of a few functions that you call. And, uh, and this book described in like two pages what the operating system was. And I said, well, thank you very much. And I took it and I stuck it in the drawer, <laughs> where it stayed for many years. <laughs> and, uh, and then went on to, to start the design of the Amiga. And, uh, you know, my background is in more in kind of architectural, uh, you know, design types of things. So I went about um, looking at what did we really need and, and how could we facilitate the, um, the ultimate goal, which was back then the Amiga was meant to be this really nice home game computer, you know, that'd be in your living room that you play games and things on. It wasn't originally designed to be an office computer. So I knew that whatever I did in terms of an operating system had to be very thin because otherwise, I, I knew what game you know, programmers would do. They'd just blow away the whole operating system and take it all over and, and just put their code directly on the, on the CPU and on the chips and not use any of what we created. And, and I think it was, you know, in all of our hearts, uh, Dale Luck and RJ and Sam Dicker, all the people that, that designed the, the software, those incredible software layers of the Amiga to really do something that was uh, really usable by everyone, even game folks, who would, who would take a look at it and say, ah, you know, I don't have to rewrite that part of it, because look, there's some good graphics, or there's some good sound code already there, I'll reuse that. Well, if you have to reuse the sound code or the graphics code, guess what layer's underneath? The exec, the operating system that uh, was, you know, the core of the, uh, the way the CPU uh, orchestrated. So. Um, the design came through the necessity of, uh, you know, they say that, you know, uh, what is it, necessity is the mother of invention, so um, we were all sitting in this room together, a very small room, probably about the size of this here, and um, it was very cramped, but, but the nice thing is that we were talking to each other daily about our, our designs, and I could see um, that everyone was compiling and trying to bring everything together, and we were, we were doing this all trying to get, you know, things compiled together. I thought, this is slowing us down to do this. We need to compile separately and just load it, just the module that we need, into the system. So, so Dale, for instance, would compile graphics, and all he'd need to do is drop the graphics library in to, uh, to test it. He wouldn't have to recompile the exec or the sound or anything, just that one. And he could move a lot faster if he did that. So that was the beginning of the idea of libraries and dynamic libraries. And so, if you know the history of, of uh, microcomputing, the Amiga was the first to have dynamically loadable libraries, which was really significant. In these days, that's you know that's the way everything works is with you know dynamically loadable libraries. And those libraries were also uh, pretty cool because they all had the, the same structure as everything else in the operating system, which was like every component of the operating system had a field, which was the name. The name of that, so the name of that library was right there, and, and some attributes of that, and that was the same for the tasking. So the multitasking came about because here you have a device that, uh, you know, these powerful chips with all these DMA channels, everything's running asynchronously. Okay, so you have to write some pretty fancy device drivers to make all that work. And uh, so I began thinking about it, and, and it was like, yes, I think. I think we can do a light, very, very lightweight uh, microkernel that will process the interrupts and dispatch and wake up the various tasks of the device driver fast enough to be able to service all of those different chips and things that were going on. So that, that you know, became the multitasking. And the multitasking was preemptive multitasking. So for its day, no one was doing preemptive multitasking on microcomputers. Uh, Apple, which was down the street uh, from us, um, was doing uh, 
uh, uh, coordinated or, or, or um, what do they call it, the uh, cooperative multitasking where you give up the CPU voluntarily. And uh, the problem with doing that is you can't ever retrofit cooperative multitasking uh, into your model. Once you've adopted that, you're stuck with that. Doing preemptive means that at any point within a program, at anywhere, it can be interrupted, lose the CPU, and another you know, task take its place. And often those were the device drivers and other things like that. Um, so then, you know, looking at the architecture, there were libraries, there were tasks, and I thought, you know, it'd be nice if there was a variation of, of the library concept that was actually for devices. So then that's where device drivers came from, and I thought, well, it'd be nice if there was a standard uh, API for, in fact, that we didn't even use the word API, no one had such a word. <laughs> but a standard approach to how you give device drivers commands. So a common set of commands for doing things on the device drivers. So structure them. So they all at least started with the same structure. And that would make it easier for you to go from device driver to device driver to see, you know, okay, I, I've seen the audio one, so now I can look at a different one for, you know, serial port or whatever, and I see that, oh, okay, it's common. There's a lot of common things in that. And then there's the custom parts of it. And so then from that built out that whole concept. And, and I revised that I had the opportunity, it was really good to, to rewrite that, completely rewrite that uh, kernel three times. And, and each time it got better and faster and, uh, and, and, and more integrated and, and uh, smoother. And then started writing the manuals for it and uh, tried to, I thought, I got to explain this really well. And, and in some, some ways that people would really be willing to you know, dive in and, and, uh, and then all of you who do, did the programming did that. You read those manuals, you, you like, guess you liked what you saw and you, you programmed the Amiga the right way because that multitasking system didn't have any kind of protection between the tasks. There was no memory protection. One, one task could write over the other task's memory and when you did that it was very hard to debug because all of a sudden you get the guru meditation and it just pop up. And uh, it, it's funny, before the guru meditation, it would just crash. And all computers back then in those days, was Apple II or was the PC, it just crashed. And the screen went blank and you know, maybe it would reboot, maybe just sit there. And I thought, that's not a very good <laughs> way to do it. And um, I thought, well, I can catch the exceptions and, and do something with those exceptions, but how do I get it to, back to the developer? How do you present the developer with that exception? You know, if they don't have something connected to the serial port or some way to know what that exception is. So I, I went to RJ and, and uh, he had begun working on intuition and he had this dialogue together and I said, could you set aside a very small amount of memory or at least guarantee that I have enough memory that I can send you just a small API call and you could put up a, a message on the screen that would, that would say, that tell, you know, tell someone something, help, you know, crash. And he said, yeah, he could do that. And I was very excited because then I could put out uh, this little message. I thought, well, this, it's just going to be a PC. You know, it's going to be the program counter and maybe the exception number. I thought, well, who's going to understand what that means? You know? <laughs> it's got, people are going to look at that. And they're going to stare at it thinking, what is that? I thought, well, they'll meditate on it. And that's where the guru of meditation, only a guru would understand what those numbers mean. So it became the guru of meditation. And, and uh, we were all pretty happy with that. It, it kind of made us feel good when it crashed because at least there was something humorous about the whole thing. And then the management came and said, you know, we don't like this whole guru of meditation idea. It doesn't sound professional. <laughs> so take it out. And I was like, no, I don't, I don't want to take it out. And they said, well, take it out. <laughs> I said, no, I don't want to take it out. So they said, take it out. Well, okay, I'll take it out. So I took it out, and it was out for, I don't know, maybe two weeks. And Dale comes in the office like, where's the guru meditation? It's like, where's the guru meditation? It was coming in my office at that point. Where's the guru meditation? I said, well, let's go together. So we all got together and went into the management office and said, we're going to bring it back and we don't really care what you think. <laughs> you don't have to deal with it, we do. So, so that got put back in, and then you know the history of all that, and, and that was very fun. So, so the Amiga came out in 1985, and uh, 
at that point, I pretty much finished exact. It was well polished. It was debugged. It worked really well. And I, I thought it's time to go on to something new. Uh, the Amiga was about, you know, fantastic computer technology. So let's make the next Amiga. Let's start that in 1985. So that maybe 1986 or 87 we could have the next one with even more fantastic chips. And uh, so I went to management again, and I said, hey, we need to start working on next Amiga. And they were like, no, no, we still got. We still got to sell this and blah blah blah, and, and I thought, well, no, we need to start working at least. It took us two years to make this one. Let's start the next one, and they weren't convinced um, about that. So I said, okay, well, I guess it's time for me to go, and and I left and went off uh, to this other company that was down the street called Apple Computer, <laughs> and there was a guy there that uh, that ran that company. Um, who really did believe that you had to have a brain trust, uh, people working on the future. And uh, so Steve Jobs had put together this group of people called Advanced Technology Group, and they were like the most amazing people. Uh, you know, other than the company where I am right now, Roku, uh, also in Silicon Valley, uh, those guys were incredible at Advanced Technology Group. Many of them were from Xerox. Many of them had written those documents. That, that I've been reading from Xerox, and uh, and also the small talk guys were there, who brought their whole object-oriented concept, and I, I really got kind of drawn into to that because the, the design I did for Exec was very object-oriented in its structure. As a matter of fact, Byte Magazine did a great article on it as soon as it came out about the object-oriented Exec. So um, went to Apple for a while. I found it kind of frustrating. It was a big company, but it was hard to make contributions. Um, they, in substitute for uh, the Amiga, uh, you know, to give me enough horsepower at Apple, they gave me a Cray computer. So it was a Cray uh, XMP48 computer that, that took uh, an entire room and ran really fast, but it idled most of the time. And the idea was to write an operating system that would run on the Cray and then run on a whole new chipset that, that uh, Apple was designing. And, and believe it or not, that was 1986 and they were working on a, a quad-core uh, chip in 1986. It was a super secret project because Motorola was the, uh, the vendor for their chips and they didn't want to piss off Motorola. And uh, so we worked on that for a couple years and the operating system designed for that and, and then they hired, uh, to, to, to fab the chip, they brought, they brought in AT&T to fab the chip. And I had some discussions with those guys and I concluded, this isn't going to work. <laughs> Because the first thing they wanted to do was port their tools, their VLSI tools, to the Cray. And, and I knew that was doomed. The Cray had a very unusual architecture. The, the upper two bits were the byte address pointers. So I knew that you just couldn't port over software to that. So I took off and I said, oh, it's time to leave Silicon Valley and, and head out. But um, a couple years later, at, a, at an Amiga conference like this, um, we were talking about what's the future of the Amiga, what would be cool. And the idea of CD-ROM came up. Everyone was like, yeah, CD-ROM gives you a lot of storage. It's easier to access. Just think of all, all the cool Amiga games and things that could be put on CD-ROM. And uh, after that conference, uh, Gail Wellington and, and, and Don Gilbert came up to me and said, you know, we, we want to make a CD-ROM-based Amiga that would be a consumer-based electronics product rather than a computer. It'd be like the original idea behind a lot of the the Commodore philosophy of you know being in you know home kind of device, and uh, and the guy that was the head of the company, well the chairman of the, of the board of the company, Irving Gould, was probably behind this. Said whatever you need, do it. Just just make it as fast as you can. So so we really went to work. And and Don Gilbert was an amazing guy because he would go over to Japan, and he had seven different Japanese companies working. At. You probably hated it because all the resources were going. And, and uh, so he had seven different Japanese companies doing different parts of it: the front panel, the the you know the controllers, the you know the different circuits and things, and, and gluing together parts of the Amiga with other things that were necessary to make that. One of the important parts was the CD-ROM, which came from Panasonic. Matsushita uh, made that for us, and and then uh, writing the driver to to uh, some you know first implementation of the spec for uh, the ISO spec for. For CD-ROM, I wrote that that driver and several other drivers, and that put it together. We had uh, a team in Los Angeles with Reichardt von Wolfschild and, and his company down there, which um, Jim Sachs was the artist there, 
and did that incredible artwork that you see on the CDTV uh, with the you know the glass, the, the optics. How many of you have seen that CDTV uh, booth? Anyone seen the CDTV? Yeah, it's just beautiful. You know, you think about what is possible. It's just like the most amazing uh, thing, and so that. That also had the automatic player, so if you put it in a regular audio CD, it would play uh, that, and the thing would, you know, look like a little player go out and shoot the laser off of the disc, and it was, it was just beautiful. So that product was a lot of fun, and uh, we got it out. But I guess it was really difficult to market a device like that. Um, we had competition. The competition was uh, Philips with CDI, and Philips had sp had, had spent two billion. Was with a B. Two billion on their CDI uh, device, and and that was also the development of many titles that they put out, uh, many of which were really good. But on our side, we had the advantage that you could take many of the Mega games, just put them right onto the CD uh, CD-ROM, plug them in, and boot right into the game. So so it was a really uh, you know it was that time that time in history when something when several things come together, the Mega technology with the CD-ROM, and it just seemed like to be perfect. But we know the history of that. <laughs> didn't go so well. But then the team in Westchester said, we can make this even better uh, and make it into a real game machine with the CD32. And we'll add better graphics and better sound and do all these enhancements that really needed to happen. And, and the CD32 was, a, was just a wonderful game ahead of its time. Would have, would have really blown away Nintendo and everyone else if, <laughs> if we'll, healthy. If, if Commodore had been healthy, it would have been, yeah, the CD32 would have replaced really the Nintendo. So I guess that's the story. Um, I, I went on after that to do several startup companies. Um, uh, Video, Video Stream was one of the companies back uh, in the mid 90s I did that was, it was like this idea of video streaming was coming. And, um, it's going to be a replacement for television. There's whole this kind of crazy period where, in the mid '90s, it was the idea of interactive television, and there was a lot of kind of money coming into that, but the technology really wasn't there to do that. It's taken a lot longer to make that uh, vision a reality. And I'm, I'm actually very fortunate and very honored to work for one of the leading companies in their area, which is Roku. And uh, we actually have some Roku guys here today: uh, Greg Garner and Anthony Wood. And uh, both these guys have an immediate history. Uh, Anthony uh, was uh, the founder of Sunrise, which was an audio uh, audio sampling. Did do audio playback or audio sampling? Audio sampling, right? Both. Yeah. And and uh, I met Anthony many years ago when I, I bought one of the boards, and they were very expensive for something for like for Amiga. And I bought it and I plugged it in, and the graphics was really good. It had these VU meters that looked really good, but I couldn't put them right in the right part part of the screen. So I called him up and he said, well, we got an update. And I said, well, can you send it to me? He said, no, <laughs> you have to pay for it. <laughs> I couldn't convince him to send it to me. I thought, this guy's a really good businessman, I think. <laughs> and he's proven his history with many other products. And uh, you, know, you can look him up on Wikipedia, he's an incredible guy. So um, so that's where I am now. And Roku makes uh, incredible products. And, and, and unlike what Commodore was willing to do, Roku's always looking ahead to the next you know, what's happening next? What's happening next year? What's happening next two years? What's the direction of the market? And they're willing to invest in the R&D to make that happen. So I, I think those of us that are engineers really appreciate that uh, kind of attitude there. So I can answer questions or do whatever you want to do at this point. I don't know how long I'll be spoken.